What's up, Austin? <laughs> I mean, it's a serious topic we're going to cover, but let's at least have some fun. I think we wanted to start really light because they told us to make you laugh. So I think that we've accomplished one goal. So now we're going to work on inspiring. Uh, there we go. These two men are such extraordinary cultural ambassadors, humanitarians. They've devoted their passion and a lot of their life to Im improving the lives of others around the globe. And today, we're going to talk about how food can make change from the most micro level to that mid-level to really the macro level. And uh, to dive in, I just want to start kind of at the beginning. Because when I think about the two of you and food, and when you've been cooking forever, and cooking at young ages changed your worlds. So in that micro sense, when you, Jose, came as an immigrant to America, and you began, began, began by cooking here, though you'd cooked in Spain as well, can you just tell us a little bit about the beginning of this passion that has fueled the change within your own life? Well, I, I think for me, when I grew up, I never sensed hunger or issues around food in my surroundings. I uh, was working families with more or less money, but I never sensed as a young boy that food was an issue. First times was probably when TV sometimes will talk about famine in faraway places. I think first time I was in the Spanish Navy, I came to Abidjan in Ivory Coast, and it's the first time that after spending there uh, seven, eight days uh, in Abidjan and surrounding areas, that this is the first time I saw that, wow, there was a lot of people that didn't have a plate of food. But my life really changed when I arrived in Washington, D.C. in 1993, and I met a guy called Robert Egger. If you talk about an amazing guy, an amazing leader, one of my life heroes, Robert Egger, he thought that he was a bartender, and he thought that waste was wrong. And he didn't want to waste food or people. So he did a kitchen called DC Central Kitchen on Ronald Reagan Inauguration Day. He began gathering all the food, leftovers, untouched trays on all the parties on Inauguration Day. He brought everything to this DC Central Kitchen. He began gathering homeless people coming out of Yale into this kitchen, began training them to be cooks, began producing foods with all those vegetables that nobody was touching, began delivering that food across the city, and he became the most amazing agent of change through food that I've seen. I met him when I was 23. Wow. I began volunteering in the kitchen, then I became many things in the organization, but that was the first moment that I saw that actually food itself, in the right hands of smart people, could become an agent of change changing the lives of many, one plate at a time, one community at a time. Um, it's so fascinating uh, to me because Jose and I have been friends for a long time and while I've heard that story and he's heard the one that I'm going to tell, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's amazing because it, it, it struck me how, I, it never occurred to me how there are two sides of the same coin. Um, I grew up as a child of privilege in New York City. I didn't know hunger. I knew the Hamptons and private schools. And over the course of my you know, childhood and into my high school years, my addiction and my alcoholism became full-blown. And I, at the same time, was running a parallel path, cooking in great kitchens, cooking with you know, Thomas Keller in New York City at Raquel. And, you know, Joachim Splichal at QV and going over and staging in France and Italy and Asia and creating a great career for myself in New York. But at the same time, I had a hidden life. And at, at a certain point, I couldn't support that hidden life uh, or that hidden life overtook my outward existence and I became unemployable. Um, and I became a user of people and a taker of things. And I moved from that place in my own personal life where I would tell you you're wrong, I didn't have a problem, to where I would tell you to go fuck off because I don't care. Leave me alone, I need to drink. And I wound up on the streets of New York homeless. And for me, 
that's what flipped it around because I needed to go to places to sleep at night. I needed to take meals from food shelters. I was living with people that no one gave a crap about. I was the guy you crossed the street to avoid. So then when I finally got sober, January 28th, 1992, um, <laughs> the, um, yay. Um, <laughs> I started working in kitchens, and I spent seven years in kitchens and running restaurants, owning restaurants in Minneapolis, and it wasn't enough. My insides weren't matching my outsides. I was learning in my recovery about patience, tolerance, and understanding, and putting my life on a different value system, but at the same time, I was cooking for the few in a restaurant that was you know, super fancy Frenchy food, and it wasn't equating, it wasn't giving me what food had given me before, and I had to find a bigger audience and a different way to teach the world about patience, tolerance, and understanding in a world that was only talking about our, our humanity by the ways in which we were divided, our skin color, our sexuality, our religion. And so I needed to create a show, I thought, that <laughs> could reach the world talking about food and culture in a different way than it had been done before. So I lied to the network and sold them one. <laughs> Is there anything about the act of cooking itself, though? Because you really, I mean, you both were in the kitchen. Oh, yeah, I mean, my parents, you know, we traveled all over, we shared food, that was the way, I mean, I'm a Jewish kid from New York, I mean, you know, anytime you were having a problem, eat your feelings. I mean, if I was upset, my grandmother would shove a piece of Hebrew national salami in my mouth. I mean, but, but, but that, while on one hand that's kind of a negative, it is, it reminds me of, of, of a night in Colorado when you shoved a giant roasted leek in my mouth <laughs> as a way to greet me with love, but that's how you show, I don't think, I don't think there's a better way on planet, I've, I've never seen a better way to communicate with other people than to serve them a bowl of food or have them serve you a bowl of food and receive it. As I travel around the world, I reversed what my whole life had been about. And as the receiver, you allow somebody the privilege of giving. And if it's somebody who doesn't have much, by receiving it, you are giving them the dignity and respect. They don't wanna be paid for it, they don't wanna be showcased for it, they just wanna show you that they're equals and that they wanna welcome you with something to eat. And it's an incredible dynamic. Food's very powerful that way. Jose, I'm wondering, um, with the work that you've done in Haiti and Puerto Rico and California, you experienced this dynamic of the accepting and the giving of food and how transformative that is. Yeah, to me, I think it was a very important moment in my life when I was um, probably eight weeks after the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. And I was cooking in one, in one of the camps uh, 2,000 people, and I took with me uh, kitchens, clean cook soaps, so to try to minimize the use of charcoals, and in partnership with this Spanish NGO called Cesal, um, you know, for the many days uh, I was there, I was cooking in that camp. But the first day, I, I bought uh, an amazing uh, black bean that they grow there, and rice, and a little bit of pork, and, I could afford to buy more expensive things for them, but it's good to keep the meals normal. And I began making these black beans my way, the <laughs> white boy way. <laughs> and I had all this amazing woman, but by the way, if we, if we think white women are the most important part of the human race, we need to realize that who feeds humanity is on the shoulders of women. Women are the ones feeding humanity. And in places like Haiti, you see it firsthand. All these women were there helping me. And when I'm about to be serving the rice with these kind of black beans stew I made, they all gather around a translator. Uh, I speak a little bit French, but there they speak Creole, and they came. And Jose, they want to tell you something. And what do they want to tell me? 
that the beans are no good. <laughs> so what do you mean they are no good? You need to understand the situation. These people didn't have the plate of hot food in two days. <laughs> what no good means? <laughs> They're no good. They like, they like them like a puree. They like them to smash. Then they like to pass them through a sheaf. And then they like these to be like a very creamy, without any skins or anything else floating, like a UFO floating on the beans, <laughs> on top of the rice. And I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> Inside, I remember those moments that always we go to gatherings like this, and where always seems that people coming from the outside is imposing what people need. Instead of listening, the people we are trying to help in the first place, what Robert Egger said, that seems that charity is, is about the redemption of the giver instead of the liberation of the receiver. There I was trying to impose what I wanted. That day was changed forever because I listened to them. We got USID rice uh, sacks. We broke them with the help of a knife and took forever while we passed those beans through like it was a sheaf. They all came at the end, they gave me a hug, they thanked me, they said bon bagay, as they say in Haiti. And that day, forever, I saw the value of a hot plate of food, but that people, they receive so much respect from anybody when you are really, are trying to help them, listening to them. They don't want our charity, they want our respect. And the way to be giving respect to people is listening to them. Andrew, I know that um, you have also, in traveling the world, had your own experiences that, to me, resonate with what Jose is saying, where you go in with one mindset, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the rope and the knife. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's amazing. I, I'm sitting here thinking that it, it was dignity and respect that was sprinkled on me when I first sobered up that made me feel welcome. It's dignity and respect and empathy and as we connect with other people that helps us be inclusive and share this planet with other people. And it is truly in listening that one gains an understanding of the world. When I go into a tribal system, uh, we spend a couple of days before we ever put the camera on our shoulders. I'm talking about a, like a protected tribe, people that we petitioned for years to get in and, and shoot with. And one of those tribes was the Juntoisie in Botswana and it took us three years to get in there, but we finally got in to live with a family group of Juntoisie for uh, a week, a group that lives indistinguishably from the way their ancestors drew on their lives on cave paintings. And they are easily the most sophisticated people I've ever met in the world. Despite appearances where they wear loincloths, they're angered at the photographers that come by and take pictures with long lenses from a mile away and never go in and share food and share work with them. And I noticed that early on in my tribal experiences. So I try to go in and actually work with the tribe because these people, I'm just you know, a poor schmuck that you know, had the, a good idea at the right time. I mean, I'm just lucky. I'm lucky to be here, I'm lucky to be alive. These people in the tribe, every single one of them is a doctor, a lawyer, a chemist, a veterinarian, an architect, a designer, a fisherman. I mean, it's, it, the skill set in the tribal world is massive. And we went one day, they were eating, for like the first three days, all we were eating were marula nuts and June bugs smashed together, roasted in the fire, and they make kind of like a tribal power bar because you only eat what nature gives you. And finally, the marula trees stopped falling from the, the nuts started, stopped falling from the marula trees and the June bugs went away and they said, oh, it's time to eat the hornbill birds. And I'm like, great, birds. <laughs> so we immediately, they said about the tribe makes a rope takes about four hours. The whole tribe does it through their toes, but they make a whole series of ropes. Some of the kids carve little wooden notches. We walk seven miles to find these little seeds. Then we walk three miles in another direction. Uh, by the way, this is in a desert where the insurance people, the security people won't let you leave camp without six bottles of water on you. They never drink water. They take little seeds and nuts and things to keep them satiated along the way. We make the little snap snares. We drop the little 
seeds or berries in there. We go back to camp. We come back the next morning, and there's a bird hanging in every snap snare who had gone after these little seeds. So in an effort to be helpful, as the great white hunter that I am, <laughs> I take my knife out of my sheath, and I lean over to cut the rope, and eight Juntoisi just gasped. I mean, there was no air left to breathe in the desert, and the, the conservancy officer who was with us had grabbed my wrist, and I was like, oh my God, what did, what did I do? And they speak in clicks, actually in clicks and whistles, so they're clicking and whistling back, and the guy says to me, um, please don't cut the rope. We, we reuse the rope. And... Um, There are certain moments that are just very, very powerful. You know, I thought I was so smart. I thought I knew everything. I thought, you know, here I am. You know, thank God this was 10, 11 years ago. I thought I knew what I was doing in every situation. And I was such, I was so, I was about to cut their rope. In my culture, we use rope once a year to tie a Christmas tree to the top of the station wagon. And we got three balls of twine in every fucking drawer in the kitchen. And there, they make rope and they use it until it falls apart into dust and goes back to the earth. And only then, only then do they make a new one. And I'm going to cut their rope. And I didn't. And ever since that moment, I have been the greenest son of a bitch. <laughs> I got five recycling things. I'm composting. But it's what I wasn't do was listening and paying attention enough. I was still thinking too much about me. You know, there's, there is, yeah, I mean, look, we all have to think about ourselves in the world, but the minute we get out of our own heads and try to be a little selfless and ask more questions, I mean, I learned, I, not only did I learn to be green, but I learned to ask more questions and actually talk to people. You know, like, how do you like your beans? You know, it's the same kind of story, you know? And it's, um, it's very, very powerful experiences that you have when you're out there working with people one by one by one. So it, the, the two of you have been on the front edge of helping uh, with disaster relief, with hunger relief. And why is it that cooks or chefs, whatever you call yourself, um, are at the front edge. Like, why has it fallen to chefs when there's FEMA, when there's the government? Why are you guys help out there helping save the world? Take that one first. <laughs> I, I think the people running those organizations are Yelpers that always gave zero stars to restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes we deserve it. But I think like when you go to Doctors Without Borders and you see the amazing work they do, and I've been in many of their operations, they have doctors taking care of the people. They don't call the, you know, Formula One driver. They don't call, you know, the guy that takes care of my lawn, or they don't call my tax advisor. They call doctors to take care of the lives of people. In the food business, it's true that chefs have not been involved, which actually we are the people that know a little bit about feeding people. <laughs> uh, so in Puerto Rico, I heard, I remember, uh, and I regret I was not in Katrina. I wish I was there, and I was in the Superdome. But I think that was one of the moments that began uh, having this call inside me of I have to go. So I've been in Haiti after the earthquake. I've been in many hurricanes in Haiti. Unfortunately, I was in Sandy this last season, Houston, uh, where we were there supporting. Sometimes you are the followers, sometimes you are the leader. But then when Puerto Rico, just we came from, from California, helping in Ventura, uh, feeding the shelters of the Red Cross and, and the firefighters. But Puerto Rico was like nothing I've ever seen. I landed there, I told my wife I would leave home for five days, and I arrived Monday, three days after the hurricane. And there was a very simple uh, problem. There was no electricity, there was no cell towers, there was no fuel, there was no diesel. Uh, the entire island was shut down. Food, restaurants were closed. Hospitals didn't have food. Doctors and nurses had nothing to eat 
because whatever food they had, they were leaving it for the patients. And nobody gave an order to feed the doctors. And so we began getting phone calls uh, from hospitals. We gathered a whole bunch of chefs, Jose Enrique, in the heart of San Juan, with one simple mission. People are hungry. We're going to gather a group of people. We're going to gather ingredients. We're going to activate the kitchen. We're going to repair the kitchen, put the generators, whatever you needed. And we began cooking. Sometimes the, biggest, the bigger problems on life, they have very simple solutions. What happened, we usually have a whole bunch of very smart people in a meeting room, that because they're so smart, we are meeting all day, and four days later, we keep meeting, <laughs> because <laughs> what if what we decide is the wrong thing? You know the wrong decision is the one you don't take. It's better to be wrong with a decision at times, but already you have a course of action that you can keep moving right and left until you find the right road, than no action at all. Chefs, we are people of action. So the first day we did 1,000 meals in one kitchen. Three weeks later, we reached one day 175,000 meals in a day and 21 kitchens and 10 food trucks. We went from 1,000 meals to I think this week we serve 3.4 million meals. At the end, we didn't think big. We actually thought they're small. Let's do 1,000 meals today. Tomorrow, can we do 2,000? Can we do 10 tomorrow? Can we do 25 the day after? And that way is how we reach the numbers we reach. We were 20 volunteers. We became 20,000 strong army of men and women. Again, sometimes the bigger problems, they have a simple solution. Don't meet and they start cooking. That was our solution. One plate at a time, we, we fed the many. I'm just, I'm just, I am curious, though. So I, I read that. I knew that. That's, and I bet like, it was beautifully and importantly covered. But how did you do that? Like, you are one person. How did, how did you end up you know, creating the kitchens, creating the army of cooks, and gathering people who were cooking for other people, many of whom probably were challenged themselves? Well, I, I think the urgency of now was a big factor. We, we saw the need. Was, we had people that they were thinking about how to feed Puerto Rico a month from now. Hunger cannot wait a month. I saw, I saw women falling in front of me because they didn't have anything to drink for three days. You know that we were giving them away rice and beans. Again, it's my life. <laughs> Dry rice and beans. And when I say we, it means we, people. Government, NGOs, no, not me personally, but so imagine this. Elderly with no water, and the homes where the elderly live run on electricity with no electricity. And the best solution we had was giving them dry rice and beans. How are they going to cook them? So sometimes we have people making decisions that I have a feeling they are not on the ground. They need to be on the ground. They cannot be in the office. They cannot be in the headquarters. You have to be out where the people in need are. So you can listen again to them what the needs are and what you see. So how we did it? People that believe that no was not a word we wanted in our vocabulary, because a lot of people told us no, we cannot. But we, we figured it out. We know where the food is. We knew where the kitchens were, and we knew how to gather a whole bunch of chefs. I pick up a phone, I send a WhatsApp to, uh, guys, I need as many chefs from hospitals, college, uh, uh, arenas, and, 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 and stadiums as you have, because they are experts on volume. And many of them, within 48 hours, began coming into the island. Plus, the chefs of Puerto Rico was not complicated. Was, let's make the food. And how are we going to deliver it? Everybody in the island wanted to help. So we began using sometimes homeland security, that they were going around the island to make sure that everything was OK. With every one of their Humvees and every one of their jeeps, they began delivering sandwiches and water and fruit. The only thing we did was that. Everything that seemed impossible, we transformed it into possible. And we never thought big. Actually, we only thought day by day. Then after, when we saw that we were going to be there in the long run, I think yesterday we did 7,000 meals. So it's not like we left the island. We still are in the island. 
But again, we never thought we were going to be there six months. We only try to solve the problems that were right there. And by doing that, uh, big problems don't look so big. The, I, I think the experience, you, you, one of the things that you, you, you hit spot on is people with the experience to help married with people who have already solved a bit of their problem. So as people were being fed in Puerto Rico and as some neighborhoods came on in little bits and, and wiggles and people could make their way to you, they wanted to help. That allows them, giving back flows dignity and respect back on top of you. You want to be able to help your own people. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with homeless and drug addicts because I was a homeless alcoholic and drug addict. And so I have actual experience with that. And so I need to take that experience and put it to good use. And so I remember being on the streets of San Francisco with an organization that I absolutely adore. They're anarchists. They've gotten a lot of shit in the in the papers, but Food Not Bombs is an incredible, incredible group of committed individuals. They don't always necessarily follow legal sequencing. It's a, it's a ready, fire, aim kind of group. Um, but before food rescue was fashionable, you know, 15 years ago, they were, uh, legally speaking, they were stealing, because you can't go into somebody's refuse bin. But behind a supermarket where there's 600 pounds of gorgeous edible food, they would take it at night and cook it and then serve breakfast or take it during the day and cook it and then serve dinner to the homeless people in San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and the other areas that they were. And I, I got a chance to tell their story one night when I was out there with them and the, the expertise, it flipped a light on inside me that, you know, there's a way that I can get this going in my own life. And so with agencies that I've been working with, groups like SUS, Services for the Underserved in New York, when I got to you know, have impact and be on their board of directors, the first thing that I wanted to do was plant gardens in our group homes. We house tens of thousands of New Yorkers that have fallen below the safety net. Uh, Services for the Underserved is a group that uh, it helps to get wellness portal to portal to people that other agencies in New York won't take on. And um, residential, job training, medical, psych, you name it. And none of them, a lot of them d couldn't have jobs. And I'm like, people need jobs. When I got sober, someone said, you gotta have a job because going and doing work and then coming home is gonna give you self-esteem. I, I had no self-esteem because I hadn't done an esteemable act in a decade. And so I realized that a lot of these people felt, you know, outwardly they may be giving you one impression of themselves, but inwardly there's so much shame associated with hunger. There's so much shame associated with having tragedy befall you, just the bad luck of the dice. There's so much shame and stigma and Shame is just, it's the worst of our human emotions. It's the most damaging, you know. It creates trauma that's transmitted if it's not transformed in our, you know, generationally. So we started doing gardens in our SUS homes and those gardens then gave off food and that food needed to be cooked. But of course the food service company wouldn't cook it because they would only cook the stuff that came in, which is another one of my Trojan horses. It turns out I'm like a sneaky son of a bitch is you what are, I am. You, you're um, all about the Trojan so horses, So we Andrew. had to have our residents in our homes cook the food. So what do you do with all these vegetables and herbs? The easiest thing is make soup. So then the next thing you know, we bought a couple of Zoop franchises and now we have rooftop gardens and now we have, you know, neighborhood gardens and we're operating franchises and we're doing job training around food. And it all started with that first seed and that first bowl of soup because that's the, that's the power that food has to transform at first one life, but after a year or two, thousands and thousands of lives. And I, I, I think it revolves around, I think what's great about chefs and why they have a special responsibility is that coming up, and I know it was true for you too, you walk in, 
the Ansel system went off or one oven is out or a delivery didn't happen. It doesn't matter. There's 100 reservations on the books. People are showing up. Yeah. How are you going to solve that problem? And you do it astronaut style. You know, yeah. you don't think, a lot of people think 30, well, we can't do this, we can't do, can't do that, because if that happens, then tomorrow we won't have tomatoes. It's like, no, 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 there is no tomorrow. I love your concept of now. So, Astronauts solve, they were telling me, 500 problems in a day. They go one by one. They never jump ahead. It's first, that's how they're trained. First this, then this, then that step, then this. Then the, and you literally count them one by one. And I think as chefs, we do the same thing. It's like, what's the problem in front of me right now? Right now. So <laughs> They're <what>? hungry. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there are so many problems that face us today in this country and in this world. And here we have um, a lot of people who are obviously very interested in this topic. And so before we get to the questions from the audience, I guess the question that I'd like to end with to, um, to inspire, which was part of our directive, is what can each and every, if you can say that serving one plate at a time to one person at a time changes lives. What can each person who's here, what, the, what can they as an individual do that is going to change the future of food and bring power and dignity to another person? You go, I go, you go. Um, take, a look at your, take a look in the mirror and ask yourself what's your skill and ask yourself if you have the will. If you have a skill and you have the will, you can make the difference in the lives of human beings everywhere. And I hate to sound like a Hallmark greeting card, but it's that, it's that darn story of the guy throwing the starfish on the beach covered in starfish and the guy shouts down from the dunes, what are you doing? There's thousands of them. You know, you're never gonna be able to save all the starfish. And the guy holds us as it matters to this one. Yep. Every, every single, you know, we're, we're, we all come into this world tabula rasa, we're all equal. If you have a skill to share and the will to do it, it can be as simply, simple as knocking on the door of the elderly person who lives next door to you. You know, the numbers say that 25% of Americans are food insecure, right? I mean, th th there are people in this room who don't know where their next three meals are coming from. I guarantee it, there's just a stigma associated with it. So reaching out and being honest, sharing your own story, being willing to listen, being helpful, I think it's a very, very simple thing. Obviously, the easy answer, volunteer at a soup kitchen, go on to worldcentralkitchen.org and donate, go on to my website. We have 20 yep. different links to agencies that I work with, you know, from refugee camps to World Central Kitchen. Yep. But make a life in another human being's life immediately. Like, you don't have to wait later on. It's yeah. that thing where someone really sits down and says, how you doing? And they really look at you and mean it. You know, touch another human being. I think it's the easiest and, thing to do. Uh, and become multi-billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> if we have few of you that become multi-billionaire, and instead of keeping your food, your, your money in the bank, you, you put it for the service in a smart investments, we're done. I Me, mean, I always say that I think I can be smart one day to be multi-billionaire, but I don't have the work ethic to be a multi-billionaire. Because I try to use keep spending my money as I make it. So I know I'll never be a billionaire. And that's another smart way to be doing it. Don't gather your fortune, but spend it as you make it. That's very smart business. I will tell everybody to be pragmatic. Don't give me a speech. And my, I have fellow chefs that give me speeches of local and seasonal. <laughs> which I love local and seasonal, but don't give me the speech as I am guilty as your jeans were made in Cambodia, your sneakers in Kenya, and you're drinking champagne from 1991 in California. Don't give me the speech about local and seasonal. Be pragmatic. And pragmatism means it's no country more generous in the history of mankind than the United States of America. And we do good. And all of you, I'm sure, you do good. But that's not enough. We need to be doing a smart good. What that means, if you have old shoes and you send the old shoes to Haiti 
and they give them around a neighborhood. What happens in that neighborhood is three families that make their living out making shoes. Sometimes we're breaking local economies in the process of doing good. We need to do a smart good. If we give so much rice for free to Haiti, but then we don't buy the local production in Haiti, we go and we put the farmers in Haiti out of business. And then when the international aid stops arriving, it's not rice producing Haiti because we put them out of business. Pragmatism is going to be very important. And doing a smart good is going to be very important. Doing good is something of the 20th century. You need to know where you put your money. If you send $1 to an NGO, you need to start asking, what is the return on the investment of my money? It's not any more giving, but it's smart giving. That's what every one of you can start doing right but now. But that, that's the. OK, the, we have to take, I mean, go, go ahead. Go one sec. Sure. The, 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 the <laughs> She's shutting you down. The, I know. Well, Let's we've try. known each other since high school. <laughs> and you're born here. We've known each other since high school. Here's the, here's the, here's the crazy thing. He's not thing. kidding you talk either. About, you talk about being smart and, and pragmatic. It's, it's pausing. It's just like when we're with a human being pausing and listening. Pause and take a look you know, at, at what the situation is. That's why I think food entrepreneurship, to your point about sneakers and stuff like that, if we can put farmers in Haiti to work growing sweet potato vines and, getting, and actually you know, getting a, an economy started, a business started. I just visited Zatari refugee camp on the Jordanian-Syrian border, and the, the micro businesses, there's a guy, all he could afford was a bucket Cucumbers that he buys every day, salt, the water is free. And he makes pickles, and he just stands there and sells pickles by the pound or kilo, right? There's another guy across who's just doing bread. All he sells are stacks of flatbread. The best pickles and the best flatbread I've eaten in a long time. But down the street is another guy who manages, he's a little, you know, got a little more on the ball. The largest business in a refugee camp of 100,000 people is a restaurant with 18 employees that even the NGO workers go to eat at. Food entrepreneurship, food entrepreneurship can jumpstart economies, and it's not necessarily a handout, but find organizations that are doing that kind of work, that are doing microeconomic development programs in these countries. That's why it's so amazing what World Central Kitchen is doing, because it's activating entrepreneurial, economic, and business change within those countries that I find so incredibly fascinating. Yeah. OK, to your questions, reading from the we're, monitor. We're adding an extra half hour on as well. <laughs> we have because questions we were a little on the monitor. <laughs> Um, okay, Andrew, I've seen you eat adventurous food finds from the streets of New Delhi to Uganda. How do you avoid getting food poisoning? Um, it's fake news. He never eats any of the food. <laughs> it's fake news, people. Do you, do you know, it, it's funny, I've never gotten ill um, overseas, aside from a night of discomfort on the loo or something. and. I really think it's because growing up, I just I always drank the water. I always ate the food. My dad was went in Rome. You know, we always went and ate everywhere. And I think my job is kind of self-selecting. If I had a delicate system, I don't think I would have lasted 12 years on television, doing what I do where I do it. Um, it's, uh, I mean, what can I say? I've got. Strong, a, I, are I've you got telling them stomach. about your new product? He's doing bizarre vaccines, so he's getting all these weird foods, pureeing them. He gives you two shots a week for a month. You're good. And you are cured for You're ever good. and ever. That flu is going away. Ladies and gentlemen, bizarre away. vaccines right here at South by Southwest. That's very high tech. We're raising a lot of money. Come see us afterwards. You're going to be a unicorn. Yeah, you can choose bags from Kenya and and you know, you can choose the inset you are gonna be inoculated with. Don't worry, you can, you can choose, um, it'll be okay. Do you think chefs and other members of the food world have a responsibility to be involved in politics? As we know, I mean, you guys are both very politically <laughs> involved and- uh, I, I don't care about politics, I care, uh, I care about social engagement happens that you have to do this with politicians. I live in the city. I, 
I don't believe in political solutions. I believe in civic uh, solutions. I think po politics is a polarizing premise to begin with. It automatically um, becomes a partisan issue. Yep. There are things we should be bipartisan on. How many people here believe that children in America should starve to death? Oh, sure. <laughs> no one. No one, Change and now this is answer. a progressive group, but I bet a lot of us would disagree <laughs> on how we would solve the problem to make sure that doesn't happen. Right. So the civic issue necessarily becomes a political one. So the way I convince myself that I'm not political is just to say I'm about civic choices and yep. civic engagement in a conversation. However, I have to do it with politicians, and if anyone follows me on social media, you. No, I'm not shy yeah. about my opinions. I also think, and this is something we talked about several years ago, a group of us, me, you, Colicchio, yep. a yep. whole bunch of guys of a certain age, said, we, we, it's, I'm not giving away any more dinners. I'm not going to give away mm. you know, another thing at a chair. We're going to spend our money and attention going and lobbying in Washington, D.C., and putting legal teeth behind the kitchen issues that we believe in. In America of the 21st century, the greatest nation in the history of the world, yep. it's no longer an embarrassment that children in America are hungry, it is criminal. Why is it illegal to sell weed? Why is it illegal to sell weed outside a, you know, a yep. high school? I know why it is, but yet we let you know, giant companies put sugary sodas in our schools and our kids don't yep. eat well, and even worse, we feed them crap so their outcomes are poor. It's ridiculous, it's so, criminal. Uh, yep. And Andrew, I mean, about the question, politics. Listen, I, I am an immigrant. Uh, I'm very happy and I'm very thankful for the opportunity I was given. But so I have to be talking on behalf of those that even had the same option as me. We have over 11 million undocumented. We have millions of dreamers, young men and women that came very much in diapers to America that they are not any different than American born. Sometimes you don't have to have a passport to love a place. Sometimes a passport is used what proves you are from where you are. But sometimes it's people that they feel as American as you or me, even if we are not giving them that opportunity to belong. My restaurants, I know they've been built on the shoulders of many immigrants. The farmers, who do you think they employ? Vast majority of those 11 million undocumented are working on the farms. The salads that our senators and congressmen are eating, chances are that those leaves of those salads were picked by undocumented immigrants. It is a big lie that we don't give the opportunity to those people to move away from the shadows of being ghosts of our food system. That's why. Unfortunately, even I wish I only had to be taking care of my teams and my employees and my guests and my business. For me, I don't think will be the right thing to do to as I'm enjoying the life I enjoy, to look to the other side when my business in part is successful thanks to the work of those men and women that we don't recognize them yet as a true Americans. So I don't want to be in politics, <laughs> but we have to speak up, and that's our role. Dignity and respect. Oh, I mean, and also, I mean, I, we we talk about this a lot. We both agree. For those who have been given a large platform, mm -hmm. I, I'm more pissed off at the other people that I know who have large platforms and do nothing. Do nothing. I believe we have a responsibility to live the change and to lead. We all do in our own way. We're all leaders, every single one of us, in our communities, in our families, with our friends. These are the issues of the day we should be talking about. Yep. Great. Um, with food fetishism and obesity now a nationwide, worldwide epidemic, what responsibility do you as food personalities have, and how has that changed your focus? It is something that I'm very conflicted about, actually. And, and, and I've been talking about it recently in, in interviews, and I know we don't have very much time, so I'll try to keep it short. But on one hand, the food fetish, 
food fetishization in America. I mean, at no time in global history has any one society been obsessed with food in a romantic way as we are here in America of the 21st century. Now, that has created a lot of other problems, right? And yet, I'm the one of the people, I mean, I've been on food, you know, TV well, for 14 years. Yeah, but you're trying to fight obesity. I mean, telling everybody eat insects, that's yeah. a way to fight obesity. Well, I, I, carry, <laughs> I carry a lot of, thank you, Jose. Um, mm. I carry a lot of good, I'm proud of the messaging of my show, but I'm also lumped into that group. We are the professionals who are, so I think that's where a, a you know, being balanced and yeah. fair in talking about it, um, I'm trying to be healthier. I know there are certain, you know, if I could wage a, wave a magic wand over the food system, other than hunger, stuff like that, and then big issues, what would I do? I'd eliminate sugar. It's a, yep. it's a poison. Um, the, it's a very difficult, difficult thing because, you know, follow the money, you know, try to, try to take sugar out of the system. Woo! Talk about politics. Yep. Um, but I do think we have a role, and I think there's lots of chefs, I mean, most most famously recently, Seamus Mullen, who has sure. come out and basically yep. documented his life and his, um, he had double sh shoulder surgery and some other illnesses and did some stem cell repair on his body and had to change the entire way he lives in terms of exercise and food. I think those stories, we can promote those people in those stories and be inspired by them to change. Every day I look at Seamus' stuff on, online, it inspires me to be healthier and better. And I also do little things. I mean, I no longer call foods ethnic foods on my show. I no longer write about those things. I, I mean, food is food, and the community can either be Chinese food or Japanese food or you know Mexican food, but it's not ethnic food. There's a dismissive diminutizing of it. There's an unfairness about it. It's, it's like, you know, I don't like women chefs and male chefs. I think, I think one of the ways we, we solve our problem our gender gap is by actually just chefs, you know? And there, there, are, ways, there are ways we can use language and, and stuff to solve yeah. some of those problems and be leaders. Uh, obesity on our, on our side, uh, on the chef's uh, food culture side, uh, I think we've been with, a, with something I don't like, which is finger pointing. We've been blaming others. We've been blaming the fast food culture. We've been blaming. And I think sometimes it's not about blaming others, but it's about everybody taking their, their part of responsibility in the process about the sugar. I, I am not the guy that I want now the government to start regulating how much sugar or not we should be, but I don't want our government to be subsidizing people that use sugar to make America fat at the expense of the American taxpayer. That's right. That's what I'm against. You guys would make great politicians, even though you don't want to be. Um, as an aid field worker, I've had to send volunteers away for not eating beans when in rural communities. What? What the is the beans importance? Beans are amazing. What is the importance of cultural sensitivity? I, cultural sensitivity is is everything. I mean, that's the respect and dignity you go out in, into the world in. Um, I famously, in a, a show in Lake Tungle Sap in Cambodia, a woman was washing fish fillets in water that had human feces in it. And um, every time it repeats, my feed just fills up. And I, and I took the opportunity to take, I mean, I knew what everyone was gonna think. The crew was like looking at me like, no, no, no. And, um, and I ate the food. And, you know, how could you do that? It's gonna be so sick, you know. At the end of the day, I'd rather be a better dinner guest than this family that doesn't even have a concept of money. The husband goes out and fishes every day and pulls his nets, and like Tunglay Sap is not as productive as it used to be. And he trades the fish for things that his family needs to support his three kids, and he lives on a raft, a floating house that sounds nicer than it actually is. Um, that blows around in the storms and gets damaged. His family's at risk of drowning every night that they, because they just drift this floating village on Lake Tungle Sap. And they were sharing their food with me with refusing recompense, and we have to be very careful about offering things because we're giving dignity and respect means allowing them to feel generous. They don't get a chance to feel generous, but they have fish. That's the one thing they have. So the last thing that I was gonna refuse was this lady's fish. So I ate the fish, and I didn't get sick. No. 
And a couple years later, I'm in an airport in France, and I see soldiers coming at me, and there's a full bird colonel at the lead, and I'm like, oh, my old junkie self is like, oh shit, what did I do? <laughs> and um, a special forces commander over in Europe, and he said, we use your shows as cultural sensitivity tapes with our special forces guys that are going into Afghanistan and you know mountainous region, Pakistan, stuff like that, and places we can't tell you about. And I'm like, for what? I mean, I hadn't made the connection. And he said, we actually have guys, the Humvee will roll into the village, and some lady grandmother comes running out with a pot of something really stinky and gross smelling to them, and they sit there, and if the guy goes, ugh, right away, they've lost the village. But if he looks there, even, they have to do mind training, like even if it's off-putting, because sometimes it might be, to say, oh my gosh, thank you, we're gonna do a couple things, you have beautiful earrings, we're gonna stop by your yeah. house and eat with you in a couple minutes, let us get settled in, they've won the village. They gotta go back and make sure to eat the food. But it's, it's amazing to me how the simple act of cultural sensitivity and acceptance changes the game completely. And now we live in a country where people abroad are thinking less of us, so I take my job as a, whatever it is that I do, way more seriously now because I may be the only American some family living in the jungle of Ecuador ever meets. Yeah. And I think with that, we need to say thank you to these extraordinary Jose and Andrew. Thank you for being a great audience. Thank oh, you all, shit. you're amazing. Thank you, people of America.